This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Souls of Black Folk by W. E. B. Du Bois. Music and Text Recorded by Toria's Uncle. Chapter 4 Of the Meaning of Progress. Willst du deine Macht verkünden, wähle sie die frei von Sünden, stehen in deinem ewigen Haus, deiner Geister Sender aus, die uns da blicken, die reinen, die nicht fühlen, die nicht weinen, nicht die zarte Jungfrau wähle, nicht der Hirten weiche Seele. Schiller Once upon a time, I taught school in the hills of Tennessee, where the broad dark veil of the Mississippi begins to roll and crumple to greet the Alleghenies. I was a Fisk student then, and all Fisk men thought that Tennessee, beyond the veil, was theirs alone, and in vacation time they sallied forth in lusty bands to meet the county school commissioners. Young and happy, I too went and I shall not soon forget that summer, seventeen years ago. First there was a teacher's institute at the county seat, and there distinguished guest of the superintendent taught the teachers fractions and spelling and other mysteries, white teachers in the morning, negroes at night, a picnic now and then, and a supper, and the rough world was softened by laughter and song. I remember how but I wonder. There came a day when all the teachers left the Institute and began the hunt for schools. I learned from hearsay, for my mother was mortally afraid of firearms, that the hunting of ducks and bears and men is wonderfully interesting, but I am sure that the man who has never hunted a country school has something to learn of the pleasures of the chase. I see now the white hot roads lazily rise and fall and wind before me under the burning July sun. I feel the deep weariness of heart and limb as ten, eight, six miles stretch relentlessly ahead. I feel my heart sink heavily as I hear again and again, Got a teacher? Yes. So I walked on and on. Horses were too expensive. Until I had wandered beyond railways, beyond stage lines, to a land of varmints and rattlesnakes, where the coming of a stranger was an event and men lived and died in the shadow of one blue hill. Sprinkled over hill and dale lay cabins and farmhouses, shut out from the world by the forests and the rolling hills toward the east. There I found at last a little school. Josie told me of it. She was a thin, homely girl of twenty, with a dark brown face and thick, hard hair. I had crossed the stream at Watertown and rested under the great willows, then I had gone to the little cabin in the lot where Josie was resting on her way to town. The gaunt farmer made me welcome, and Josie, hearing my errand, told me anxiously that they wanted a school over the hill, that but once since the war had a teacher been there, that she herself longed to learn, and thus she ran on, talking fast and loud with much earnestness and energy. Next morning I crossed the tall round hill lingered to look at the blue and yellow mountains stretching toward the Carolinas, then plunged into the wood and came out at Josie's home. It was a dull frame cottage with four rooms, perched just below the brow of the hill amid peach trees. The father was a quiet, simple soul, calmly ignorant with no touch of vulgarity. The mother was different, strong, bustling, and energetic with a quick, restless tongue, and an ambition to live like folks. There was a crowd of children, 
Two boys had gone away. There remained two growing girls, a shy midget of eight, John, tall, awkward, and eighteen, Jim, younger, quicker, and better looking, and two babies of indefinite age. Then there was Josie herself. She seemed to be at the center of the family, always busy at service or at home, or berry-picking, a little nervous and inclined to scold, like her mother, yet faithful too, like her father. She had about her a certain fineness, a shadow of an unconscious moral heroism that would willingly give all of life to make life broader, deeper, and fuller for her and hers. I saw much of this family afterwards, and grew to love them for their honest efforts to be decent and comfortable, and for their knowledge of their own ignorance. There was with them no affectation. The mother would scold the father for being so easy, Josie would roundly berate the boys for carelessness, and all knew that it was a hard thing to dig a living out of a rocky side hill. I secured the school. I remember the day I rode horseback out to the commissioner's house with a pleasant young white fellow who wanted the white school. The road ran down the bed of a stream. The sun laughed and the water jingled, and we rode on. "'Come in,' said the commissioner. "'Come in. Have a seat. Yes, that certificate will do. Stay to dinner. What, do you want a month?' "'Oh,' thought I, "'this is lucky.' But even then fell the awful shadow of the veil, for they ate first, then I, alone. The schoolhouse was a log hut, where Colonel Wheeler used to shelter his corn. It sat in a lot behind a rail fence and thorn bushes near the sweetest of springs. There was an entrance where a door once was, and within a massive, rickety fireplace. Great chinks between the logs served as windows. Furniture was scarce. A pale blackboard crouched in the corner. My desk was made of three boards, reinforced at critical points, and my chair, borrowed from the landlady, had to be returned every night. Seats for the children. These puzzled me much. I was haunted by a New England vision of neat little desks and chairs. But, alas, the reality was rough plank benches without backs, and at times without legs. They had the one virtue of making naps dangerous, possibly fatal, for the floor was not to be trusted. It was a hot morning late in July when the school opened. I trembled when I heard the patter of little feet down the dusty road and saw the growing row of dark, solemn faces and bright, eager eyes facing me. First came Josie and her brothers and sisters. The longing to know, to be a student in the great school at Nashville, hovered like a star above this child woman amid her work and worry, and she studied doggedly. There were the Dowells, from their farm over toward Alexandria, Fanny with her smooth black face and wondering eyes, Martha, brown and dull, the pretty wife-girl of a brother, and the younger brood. There were the Burks, two brown and yellow lads, and a tiny, haughty-eyed girl. Fat Reuben's little chubby girl came with golden face and old gold hair, faithful and solemn. Fanny was on hand early, a jolly, ugly, good-hearted girl, who slyly dipped snuff and looked after her little bow-legged brother. When her mother could spare her, Tildy came, a midnight beauty, with starry eyes and tapering limbs, and her brother correspondingly homely. And then the big boys, the hulking Lawrences, the lazy Neils, unfathered sons of mother and daughter, Hickman with a stoop in his shoulders, and the rest. There they sat, nearly thirty of them, on the rough benches, their faces shading from a pale cream to a deep brown, the little feet bare and swinging, the eyes full of expectation, with here and there a twinkle of mischief, and the hands grasping Webster's blue-black spelling book. I loved my school, and the fine faith the children had in the wisdom of their teacher was truly marvelous. We read and spelled together, wrote a little, picked flowers, sang, and listened to stories of the world beyond the hill. At times the school would dwindle away, and I would start out, I would visit Mun Eddings, who lived in two very dirty rooms, and ask why little Lugene, whose flaming face seemed ever ablaze with the dark red hair uncombed was absent all last week. Or why I missed so often the inimitable rags of Mac and Ed. Then the father, who worked Colonel Wheeler's farm on shares, would tell me how the crops needed the boys, and the thin, slovenly mother, whose face was pretty when washed, assured me that Lugene must mind the baby, but we'll start them again next week. When the Lawrences stopped, 
I knew that the doubts of the old folks about book learning had conquered again, and so, toiling up the hill and getting as far into the cabin as possible, I put Cicero Pro Archia Poeta into the simplest English with local applications, and usually convinced them for a week or so. On Friday nights I often went home with some of the children, sometimes to Doc Burke's farm. He was a great, loud, thin black, ever working, and trying to buy the seventy-five acres of hill and dale where he lived, but people said that he would surely fail and the white folks would get it all. His wife was a magnificent Amazon with saffron face and shining hair, uncorseted and barefooted, and the children were strong and beautiful. They lived in a one-and-a-half-room cabin in the hollow of the farm near the spring. The front room was full of great, fat, white beds, scrupulously neat, and there were bad chromos on the walls and a tired center table. In the tiny back kitchen I was often invited to take out and help myself to fried chicken and wheat biscuit, meat and corn pone, string beans and berries. At first I used to be a little alarmed at the approach of bedtime in the one lone bedroom, but embarrassment was very deftly avoided. First all the children nodded and slept and were stowed away in one great pile of goose feathers. Next the mother and the father discreetly slipped away to the kitchen while I went to bed. Then, blowing out the dim light, they retired in the dark. In the morning all were up and away before I thought of awaking. Across the road where Fat Reuben lived, they all went outdoors while the teacher retired, because they did not boast the luxury of a kitchen. I liked to stay with the Dowells, for they had four rooms and plenty of good country fare. Uncle Bird had a small, rough farm, all woods and hills, miles from the big road. But he was full of tales. He preached now and then, and with his children, berries, horses, and wheat, he was happy and prosperous. Often, to keep the peace, I must go where life was less lovely. For instance, Tildy's mother was incorrigibly dirty. Reuben's larder was seriously limited, and herds of untamed insects wandered over the Eddings' beds. Best of all, I loved to go to Josie's and sit on the porch, eating peaches while the mother bustled and talked. How Josie had bought the sewing machine, how Josie worked at service in winter, but that four dollars a month was mighty little wages. How Josie longed to go away to school, but that it looked like they never could get far enough ahead to let her. How the crops failed and the well was yet unfinished, and finally, how mean some of the white folks were. For two summers I lived in this little world. It was dull and humdrum. The girls looked at the hill in wistful longing, and the boys fretted and haunted Alexandria. Alexandria was town, a straggling lazy village of houses, churches, and shops, and an aristocracy of toms, dicks, and captains. Cuddled on the hill to the north was the village of the colored folks, who lived in three or four room unpainted cottages, some neat and homelike, and some dirty. The dwellings were scattered rather aimlessly, but they centered about the twin temples of the hamlet, the Methodist and the Hardshell Baptist churches. These in turn leaned gingerly on a sad colored schoolhouse. Hither my little world wended its crooked way on Sunday to meet the other worlds, and gossip, and wonder and make the weekly sacrifice with frenzied priest at the altar of the old-time religion. Then the soft melody and mighty cadences of negro song fluttered and thundered. I have called my tiny community a world, and so its isolation made it. And yet there was among us but a half-awakened common consciousness, sprung from common joy and grief at burial, birth, or wedding, from a common hardship in poverty, poor land, and low wages, and, above all, from the sight of the veil that hung between us and opportunity. All this caused us to think some thoughts together, but these, when ripe for speech, were spoken in various languages. Those whose eyes, twenty-five and more years before, had seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, saw in every present hindrance or help a dark fatalism bound to bring all things right in his own good time. The mass of those to whom slavery was a dim recollection of childhood found the world a puzzling thing. It asked little of them, and they answered with little, and yet it ridiculed their offering. Such a paradox they could not understand, 
and therefore sank into listless indifference or shiftlessness or reckless bravado. There were, however, some, such as Josie, Jim, and Ben, to whom war, hell, and slavery were but childhood tales, whose young appetites had been whetted to an edge by school and story and half-awakened thought. Ill could they be content, born without and beyond the world, and their weak wings beat against their barriers, barriers of caste, of youth, of life. At last, in dangerous moments, against everything that opposed even a whim, The ten years that follow youth, the years when first the realization comes that life is leading somewhere, these were the years that passed after I left my little school. When they were passed, I came by chance once more to the walls of Fisk University, to the halls of the Chapel of Melody. As I lingered there in the joy and pain of meeting old school friends, there swept over me a sudden longing to pass again beyond the Blue Hill, and to see the homes and the schools of other days and to learn how life had gone with my school children, and I went. Josie was dead, and the gray-haired mother said simply, We've had a heap of trouble since you've been away. I had feared for Jim. With a cultured parentage and a social caste to uphold him, he might have made a venturesome merchant or a West Point cadet. But here he was, angry with life and reckless, and when Fanner Durham charged him with stealing wheat, the old man had to ride fast to escape the stones which the furious fool hurled after him. They told Jim to run away, but he would not run, and the constable came that afternoon. It grieved Josie, and great awkward John walked nine miles every day to see his little brother through the bars of Lebanon jail. At last the two came back together in the dark night. The mother cooked supper, and Josie emptied her purse, and the boys stole away. Josie grew thin and silent, yet worked the more. The hill became steep for the quiet old father, and with the boys away there was little to do in the valley. Josie helped them to sell the old farm, and they moved nearer town. Brother Dennis, the carpenter, built a new house with six rooms, and Josie toiled a year in Nashville and brought back ninety dollars to furnish the house and change it to a home. When the spring came and the birds twittered, and the stream ran proud and full, little sister Lizzie, bold and thoughtless, flushed with the passion of youth, bestowed herself on the tempter and brought home a nameless child. Josie shivered and worked on, with the vision of school days all fled, with a face wan and tired. Worked until, on a summer's day, someone married another. Then Josie crept to her mother like a hurt child and slept, and sleeps. I paused to scent the breeze as I entered the valley. The Lawrences have gone, father and son forever, and the other son lazily digs in the earth to live. A new young widow rents out their cabin to fat Reuben. Reuben is a Baptist preacher now, but I fear as lazy as ever, though his cabin has three rooms. And little Ella has grown into a bouncing woman and is plowing corn on the hot hillside. There are babies plenty, and one half-witted girl. Across the valley is a house I did not know before, and there I found rocking one baby and expecting another, one of my schoolgirls, a daughter of Uncle Bird Dowell. She looked somewhat worried with her new duties, but soon bristled into pride over her neat cabin and the tale of her thrifty husband, and the horse and cow and the farm they were planning to buy. My log schoolhouse was gone. In its place stood progress, and progress, I understand, is necessarily ugly. The crazy foundation stones still marked the former site of my poor little cabin, and not far away on six weary boulders perched a jaunty board house, perhaps twenty by thirty feet, with three windows and a door that locked. Some of the window glass was broken, and part of an old iron stove lay mournfully under the house. I peeped through the window half reverently and found things that were more familiar. The blackboard had grown by about two feet, and the seats were still without backs. The county owns the lot now, I hear, and every year there is a session of school. As I sat by the spring and looked on the old and the new, I felt glad, very glad, and yet... 
After two long drinks I started on. There was the great double log house on the corner. I remembered the broken, blighted family that used to live there. The strong, hard face of the mother with its wilderness of hair rose before me. She had driven her husband away, and while I taught school a strange man lived there, big and jovial, and people talked. I felt sure that Ben and Tildy would come to naught from such a home. But this is an odd world, for Ben is a busy farmer in Smith County, doing well too, they say, and he had cared for little Tildy until last spring when the lover married her. A hard life the lad had led, toiling for meat, and laughed at because he was homely and crooked. There was Sam Carlin, an impudent old skinflint, who had definite notions about niggers, and hired Ben a summer and would not pay him. Then the hungry boy gathered his sacks together and in broad daylight went into Carlin's corn, and when the hard-fisted farmer set upon him the angry boy flew at him like a beast. Doc Burke saved a murder and a lynching that day. The story reminded me again of the Burks, and an impatience seized me to know who won in the battle, Doc or the seventy-five acres, for it is a hard thing to make a farm out of nothing, even in fifteen years. So I hurried on, thinking of the Burks. They used to have a certain magnificent barbarism about them that I liked. They were never vulgar, never immoral, but rather rough and primitive, with an unconventionality that spent itself in loud guffaws, slaps on the back, and naps in the corner. I hurried by the cottage of the misborn Neal boys. It was empty, and they were grown into fat, lazy farmhands. I saw the home of the Hickmans, but Albert, with his stooping shoulders, had passed from the world. And then I came to the Burke's gate and peered through. The enclosure looked rough and untrimmed, and yet there were the same fences around the old farm, save to the left, where lay twenty-five other acres. And lo, the cabin in the hollow had climbed the hill and swollen to a half-finished six-room cottage. The Burke's held a hundred acres but they were still in debt. Indeed, the gaunt father who toiled night and day would scarcely be happy out of debt, being so used to it. Some day he must stop, for his massive frame is showing decline. The mother wore shoes, but the lion-like physique of other days was broken. The children had grown up. Rob, the image of his father, was loud and rough with laughter. Bertie, my school baby of six, had grown to a picture of maiden beauty tall and tawny. "'Edgar's gone,' said the mother, with head half-bowed. "'Gone to work in Nashville. He and his father couldn't agree. Little Doc, the boy born since the time of my school, took me horseback down the creek the next morning toward Farmer Dowell's. The road and the stream were battling for mastery, and the stream had the better of it. We splashed and waded, and the merry boy perched behind me chattered and laughed. He showed me where Simon Thompson had bought a bit of ground and a home, but his daughter, Lana, a plump brown slow girl, was not there. She had married a man and a farm twenty miles away. We wound on down the stream till we came to a gate that I did not recognize, but the boy insisted that it was Uncle Bird's. The farm was fat with the growing crop. In that little valley was a strange stillness as I rode up, for death and marriage had stolen youth and left age and childhood there. We sat and talked that night after the chores were done. Uncle Bird was grayer, and his eyes did not see so well, but he was still jovial. We talked of the acres bought, one hundred and twenty-five, of the new guest chamber added, of Martha's marrying. Then we talked of death. Fanny and Fred were gone. A shadow hung over the other daughter, and when it lifted she was to go to Nashville to school. At last we spoke of the neighbors, and as the night fell Uncle Bird told me how, on a night like that, Penny came wandering back to her home over yonder to escape the blows of her husband, and next morning she died in the home that her little bow-legged brother, working and saving, had bought for their widowed mother. My journey was done, and behind me lay hill and dale and life and death. How shall man measure progress there, where the dark-faced Josie lies? How many heartfuls of sorrow shall balance a bushel of wheat? How hard a thing is life to the lowly, and yet how human and real? 
and all this life and love and strife and failure? Is it the twilight of nightfall, or the flush of some faint dawning day? Thus sadly musing, I rode to Nashville in the Jim Crow car. End of chapter 4